As World War I came to a close, it was apparent that the face of war was changing. The days of armies burrowing into the trenches for years on end seemed to be a thing of the past. The importance of air supremacy was being realized. Much like it had changed naval warfare by eliminating the need for huge battleships by replacing them with aircraft carriers, the ground warfare tactics were also changing. The ability to destroy a country's factories and plants were more impactful than stopping that country's war machine by going directly to the source. But this was no easy task. Enter the U.S. bomber. The B-17 and the B-24s were often referred to as the flying fortresses. They were heavily armed and could fly at altitudes well over 30,000 feet. They often had a range of over 2,000 miles and more, allowing them to cover areas deep into enemy territory. The first model was finished by Boeing in July 28th of 1935. It was simply known as Model 299. It would be quickly designated as the B-17 by the United States Army Air Corps. The B-17 would be the first Boeing aircraft that would feature a flight deck instead of an open cockpit. And the first B-17s would be used by the British Air Force in 1941 for high altitude bombing missions. The first mass production model of this type of aircraft would be the Boeing B-17E, capable of carrying a 4,000 pound bomb load and was prote protected by nine machine guns. Boeing would go on to build 6,981 B-17s. These were various models with improvements occurring in each version. Later, 5,745 would be built by Douglas and Lockheed as well. This would include the B-17F. One of these amazing aircraft would go on to have a history of its own as well as her crew. Both the plane and her crew would become famous. The specifications for Model 299 or the B-17 bomber would be as follows. The first flight would be on July 28, 1935, which was the prototype, and that was model number 299. The classification would be bomber class, and the span would be 103 feet 9 inches. She would be 74 feet 9 inches long and with a weight of 65,000 pounds. The top speed would be 287 miles per hour, the cruising speed would be 150 miles an hour, and the maximum range would be 3,750 miles, with a ceiling of 35,600 feet. The power would be supplied by four 1,200 horsepower Wright R182097 engines, and the accommodations would be for two pilots, a bombardier, a navigator, a radio operator, and five gunners. The armament would be up to 13 machine guns and a 9,600 pound bomb capacity load. On July 2nd, 1942, one of these B-17F bombers was be designated with the serial number 41-24485. This aircraft would eventually become known as the Memphis Bell and would go on to become America's most famous bomber. Opinions vary on what or who the plane was named after, everything from the pilot's fiance to the character in a film seen in Maine. The film would be named Lady for a Night and starred Jean Blondell. Blondell played a character named Jenny Blake who owned and operated a casino boat and that boat's name was the Memphis Belle. It is also said that Bob Morgan wanted to name the, little pla the plane Little One which was a pet name for his sweetheart, Margaret Polk, but thought that Memphis Bell would be a much better name. Incidentally, Margaret Polk would be the inspiration for the naming of the plane. She was from Memphis, Tennessee. And depending on who tells the story, versions vary, but it was said that the crew did not like the name and needed to be induced by alcohol in order to accept it. The painting of the girl on the side of the plane also had different origins, depending on who you asked. The most popular opinion being that the girl is from Esquire magazine. To be specific, a pinup from April issue of 1941 Esquire magazine. These illustrations were painted by artist George Petty. 
versions of a copy of an Esquire illustration being painted on or Petty himself painting the image onto the plane cannot be verified. The truth is that no one recalls for sure who painted the image. But the image was painted on the aircraft at Dow Field shortly before the aircraft left the United States for service. Memphis Bell's nose art was touched up later and repainted by Corporal Tony Starser at Basingbourne, England. Starser became well known for his artistic talent and he painted nose art on several the 91st Bomb Group aircraft and air crew flight jackets as well. The following crew members of the Memphis Bell would successfully return from 25 bombing missions. Bob Morgan, the pilot, Jim Varinus, the co-pilot, Bob Hansen, the radio operator, Cecil Scott, the ball turret gunner, Vince Evans, the bombardier, J.P. Quinlan, the tail gunner, Bill Winchell, waste gunner, Scott Miller, the waste gunner, Joe Jimbroni, crew chief, Levi Dillon, the top turret gunner, Eugene Atkins, the top turret gunner, and Harold Locke, waste gunner. It is worth noting that the tail gunner, John Quinlan, who was wounded during the mission on ruined France on March 28, 1943, survived a wound and is the only member of the crew that was awarded the Purple Heart. It is also worth noting that the actual crew completed 25 missions, some of which were on different B-17 bombers. The Memphis Bell also had different crews at times. The official crew completed 25 missions and the Memphis Bell herself completed her 25th mission with an entirely different crew aboard. The Memphis Bell will be assigned to the 324th Bomb Squadron, 91st Bomb Group at Basingbourne, England. She would go on to complete 25 missions during her time of duty, which was from Nev November of 1942 to May of 1943. Her targets would include areas in Germany, France, and Belgium. At the time, the Air Force lost one bomber for every 18 sorties. A sortie is one aircraft flying on one mission, so the odds of the plane and its crew successfully completing 25 missions were not very good. In 1942, Germany had launched a fleet of U-boats. These were submarines that were attacking and destroying ships carrying supplies and soldiers across the Northern Atlantic and were on top priority for the U.S. Air Force. In fact, Memphis Bell, her main reason, or one of her main reasons for being there was for the bombing and disruption of bases and factories in Germany and occupied territories. The Memphis Bell's first mission occurred on November 7, 1942 your target would be a submarine pens in Brest, France. The mission would be successful with no loss of life or damage to the Memphis Bell, giving the crew a false sense of security. The British bombers went on their missions at night, and when bombing targeted areas, it was more of a blanketing type of bombing, but the U.S. wanted to be more accurate in hitting the targets and cut down on civilian casualties. Also, the higher altitude meant that they now had the ability to bomb or do missions during the day. Also in 1942, in hopes of boosting morale, Major William Wyler went to England to film heavy bomber operations. Among the many planes filmed, he also filmed the Memphis Bell. He would also record combat scenes and bombing missions. In fact, he would release a documentary film featuring the Memphis Bell called Memphis Bell, A Story of a Flying Fortress in 1944 and this included much of the footage that he shot. Lieutenant Colonel William Wyler would go on to Hollywood after his military career to direct successful films, and his most notable or famous would be the film Ben-Hur. The Memphis Bell and her crew would each complete 25 missions, earning them the right to complete their tour of duty and go home. Despite the crew manning other B-17 bombers and the Memphis Bell being operated by other crews, both their completions and their final 25th missions occurred within days of each other. The Memphis Bell's crew 25th mission ended on May 17, 1943 and was actually the aircraft's 24th mission. On May 19, two days later, the Memphis Bell would complete her 25th mission while manned by a different crew. 
The fact that the Memphis Bell was also the first heavy bomber to return with her crew intact from 25 missions also made her famous. It is important to note that there were several crew changes, both in positions and in personnel during that time, and that the list of the crew members that left the U.S. initially was different than the list of names on the return trip. Having already having rec recognition, the Air Force decided to have the Memphis Bell and her crew undertake one more assignment. Dubbed her 26th mission, the Memphis Bell and her crew would trek across the United States making 30 stops to promote war bonds as well as morale. In fact, it would be General Jacob Devers who would quote in 1943 the summer the following. You are being sent on another mission, perhaps the most important of the many on which you have flown in this famous plane. It is to carry a message which should hearten a great people. The attention that the plane and crew received along the way by newspapers and newsreels made them celebrities. The release of the film Memphis Bell, a story of a flying fortress, only increased their status to legendary. It was also a Hollywood release of a film, Memphis Belle, that was released in 1990, which renewed the popularity of the plane and her crew and introduced them to a new generation of fans and admirers. Once the tour for the Bonds was finished, the crew headed home and the plane headed to MacDill Army Air Force Base in Florida. She was to be used for training purposes. But when the war was over, the Memphis Belle was then moved to the Altus Army Airfield in Oklahoma, where she was stored. And once stored at this location, the planes were either used for parts or just waiting to be scrapped. However, in 1946, the city of Memphis, Tennessee was able to acquire the legendary aircraft, and it was put proudly on display in front of the National Guard Armory. There it stayed until 1977. The plane was then moved for restoration and it was designated as on loan by the U.S. Air Force. It was then that the Memphis Bell Memorial Association would be formed and the plane was on display on, on Mud Island from 1987 to 2002. She was then taken for additional restoration. However, due to lack of funds and resources, the Memphis Bell Memorial Association would release, release the plane to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. The museum restoration of the Memphis Bell would last from 2005 until 2018. The plane would be fully restored. However, the damaged areas were left alone. With every inch of the plane restored to the way she was when she completed her 25th mission, on May 17, 2018, on the 75th anniversary of the crew's 25th mission, she would be unveiled and put on permanent display. Today she sits proudly on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force, where both herself and her crew can be given the place in history that they so deserve. <laughs>